get the, the, the webinar going? All right, be happy to. I'm Ed Corazalem, University of Minnesota. Actually, I'm, I guess I'm Skyping you guys, whatever that happens to mean, but I'm sitting in my office looking at the same slides that you are. Um, we're going to go through sort of a condensed version of uh, how to read a spirometry test um, whenever you guys are ready. Shall we move forward? You guys still out there? I think they're... Let's see. Whoops, I see a stop presenting. Oh, don't hit, or er, that, that just means Okay. Oops, I goofed. Um. Yeah, they can hear us. It's uh. I think they I may can't have hear just, them. They they may have just muted their mic. So there's less background. Oh, that's nice. Okay, can they see my slides? <laughs> Yeah, we can see the slides now, again. Alrighty, and you guys can hear me. Alright. Well, um, hopefully you have a copy of the Spirometry One Page Interpretation Guide. Um, this is something that uh, the American Lung Association and I developed a few years back to help providers read pulmonary function testing. Quite honestly, the hardest part about reading pulmonary function testing is actually getting a good test. And so a part of what I'll teach you today is how to recognize a good test. A couple studies that have been done suggested that less than 20 to 30 percent of all tests done in primary care are actually readable. And so we need to have sort of a good feedback mechanism to the people that are doing the test so that the provider gets good, good quality tests. You can't read a test that's not done well. So really, what does spirometry measure? First off, quite simply, it measures how fast, how fast the air comes out of your patient. Flow rates are like FEV1. It's expressed in liters, but it's the amount of air that comes out in the first second. The FEV1 over the vital capacity, or the FVC, is another measure of flow. And the American Thoracic Society has decided that a decreased flow rate equals obstructive disease. They've also defined obstruction as an <coughs> FEV1 over the vital capacity below the lower limits of normal. Now, some spirometers aren't sophisticated enough to spit out the lower limits of normal for us, and so I've developed the 10 down rule. In other words, if the FEV1 over FVC is down 10 from predicted, so if you have a person that's predicted ratio would be 80%, that means that they should take a big breath, they blow really hard, predicted they should get 80% of their air out in the first second. So their ratio FEV1 over the FVC would be 0.7, or in this case 0.8. Now, if the patient blows 0.7 or 70% of their air out in the first second, with the FEV1 over vital capacity being down 10 from predicted, we'll call that airflow obstruction. You can divide patients up as being obstructive or restrictive when you do spirometry. Obstructive disease means the air comes out too slow. Restrictive disease means the lungs are too small or the vital capacity is too small, I should say. A decreased vital capacity means possible restrictive disease. Now, this is the flow loop. Flow volume loop is what we currently use for diagnostics. And again, it's simply a graph that shows how fast the air comes out of your patient. Now keep in mind, flow rates are proportional to airway caliber. And I show you, just for fun, Pozzaville's equation here on laminar flow. What I've highlighted in red on the equation is to suggest that flow is proportional to the radius to the fourth power. And what that means is that small changes in the radius of the tube, in this case I'm talking about the entire bronchial tree, 
small changes in the radius have a large effect on the flow. And that's really why spirometry is useful. The FEV1 is a nice reflection of the average diameter of the bronchial tree. So as the bronchial tree gets constricted or smaller or narrowed, like in asthma, the FEV1 goes down. We give a bronchial dilator, the, the airways open up, and the FEV1 in turn responds by increasing and getting more air out in the first second is really what we're measuring. This is right out of the American Thoracic Society's 2005 Interpretive Strategies for Lung Function Test. And as I have highlighted in red here, obstruction is the FEV1 over the FEC below the fifth percentile. And again, we're going to talk about what's called the rule of thumb down 10 from predicted. So here's our pre-test question. According to the American Thoracic Society, does this flow volume loop show airflow obstruction? Now, in a lot of my webinars, we're able to do interactiveness. But on these Skype things, I don't think there's any way that you can really answer my question here. But anyway, we have an A, which is yes, B, no, C depends on the patient's age, or D depends on the patient's height. Now, this is the summary of responses from webinars that I taught from 2010 to 2014. The N of providers was a little bit over 1,000. And as we can see, the predominant answer was yes. And we see at 68% and at 18% no, and about 6% said depends on the age, and about 9% depends on the height. Well, the actual answer is it depends on the height, or excuse me, <laughs> depends on the age, depends on the age. And what that has to do with is the fact that we lose elastic recoil as we age. And what happens is the FEV1 goes down faster than the vital capacity as we get older. And so the ratio goes down as we get older. And we can see here, this is the NHANES database. This was 9,000 people blowing into spirometers of all different heights and weights and sizes and shapes and ages. And what they did is patients from 8 to 80. And what you can see here is that an 8-year-old, a normal ratio would be almost 90, about 89, 88%. In other words, an 8-year-old take a big breath, blow hard, they get 88% of their air out in the first second. If we're talking about the rule of thumb or the 10 down rule, that means that the patient would have to blow 78% before we would say they have airflow obstruction. But now in turn, if we look at somebody in their 80s, we see the normal ratio is actually closer to 72. That's totally normal for the predicted of somebody in their 80. If we use the 10 down rule, their ratio would have to be below 60 or 62, excuse me, around 62, before we would say they have airflow obstruction. And so the answer to the question is it depends on the patient's age. Now, the reason why so many providers got the question wrong, 68%, is the old textbook said anything below 70, an FEV1 over FVC of 70, was obstructed. The American Thoracic Society wants us to move away from fixed values to lower limits of normal. <laughs> Why should we use the FEV1 over the FVC to define obstruction? Well, there's a lot of good reasons, and this is the new data that came out of the Global Lung Function <laughs> in 2012, and what they found is that the predicted FEV1 FVC ratio is the same in both sexes and in all ethnic groups at any given age and height. This implies that the differences in FEV1 and FVC between ethnic groups are proportional and independent of age or ethnicity. We know that, say, an African American has about a 12% smaller vital capacity than a Caucasian, but the ratio is the same for the same age and height. This suggests that the differences in pulmonary indices between ethnic groups are therefore just a matter of scale. So if we know the right predicted for somebody of any ethnic group, we can tell whether or not they have airflow obstruction regardless if we have reference equations for that ethnic group. That becomes a real valuable point when you're talking about pulmonary physiology. The American Thoracic Society has also moved away from 80% 
The old textbooks used to say anything below 80% was abnormal. They also would like us to use lower limits of normals as opposed to fixed ratios. And why? The Global Lung Initiative found that the lower limits of normal for FEV1 for a 5-year-old, a 20-year-old, and an 80-year-old is actually 74%, 80%, and 66% of the predicted value. So you're just fine if you use the 80% if the patient's 20, but you're getting far away from what's true if the patient in front of you is 80, or if the patient is 5, which is in the case you might see at being pediatrician. All right, so let's go ahead and do a, t a test sample of how to read a PFP. The American Thoracic Society says the first thing you need to do is begin with a review and comment of the test quality. We're going to go over the test that we just saw in the sense of our pre-test examination. And the question is, is it a good test? How you determine if it's a good test is you want to look to make sure that the flow volume loop traces right over the top. The American Thoracic Society says traceability equals repeatability. If they trace over the top, you knew it's probably a good blow. We use the flow volume curve, the curves on the left here, to determine if it has a nice rapid rise, if it's got a point at the top, if it's a smooth, continuous curve. The American Thoracic Society says there can't be any cough, glitch, or stop in the first second because we use the first second to determine severity of disease. The FEV1 is mild, moderate, severe asthma, mild, moderate, severe COPD. It's the FEV1 that determines severity of disease. It's the ratio, FEV1 over FVC, that determines if a patient has airflow obstruction. I'll talk about that more in a minute. The other part about being a good test is did the patient blow long enough? Now keep in mind, if we're defining obstruction as an FEV1 over FVC below the lower limits of normal, if the patient doesn't blow all of their vital capacity out, the ratio will be erroneously elevated. And so the ratio means nothing. That's why the American Thoracic Society really pushes us to get the patient to blow, 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 get all their air out before we have the patient take a breath back in. The volume time curve over here, also known as the spirometry curve, should show a plateau in a minimum of six seconds blow time. That's the key to a good test. We need a smooth, continuous flow loop to test that trace over the top, and we need a volume time curve that shows a blow that's long enough. Anytime there's a low vital capacity, I tell my students to always look at the blow time because many times that's the reason for the low vital capacity. Again, just in review, the flow volume curve can be provide the means to assess the quality during the initial point portion of the vital capacity maneuver. Peak flows, rapid rise, and also traceability equals repeatability. The volume time curve can be used to evaluate the latter part of the vital capacity maneuver. Did it plateau? Did they blow for six seconds? Little kids only have to, under 10, only have to blow for three seconds. So you've got a good test. Now the question is, let's how do you reread the test? Well, the first thing that I do is I look at the predicted ratio. In this case, this person has a predicted ratio of 83. So this is a young person, probably in their 20s or 30s. They should be able to take a big breath and blow hard as they can. They should get 83 of their total vital capacity out in the first second. Well, our patient only blew 70% in their first second. They meet the 10 down criterion. In other words, 83 minus 10 would be 73. So even if this patient blew 73% of their air out in the first second, we would say they had airflow obstruction. Now you can see my computers are sophisticated enough to highlight things below the lower limits of normal. It's highlighted in red and it has a little asterisk next to it. I put that on there so when we fax the reports, the doctors can actually see that this this asterisk means it's below the lower limits of normal. Again, we already determined it was a good blow. We had good volume time curve and a good flow volume loop. Now, once we determine if the patient has airflow obstruction, then we need to decide what is severity. Severity is always related to the FEV1, both in all diseases. 
that we talk about. In this case, the FEV1 is 73%. So again, just for review, the ratio determines if a patient has obstruction. The FEV1 determines the severity of said obstruction. Now this part of this table is right in the middle of your algorithm if you have that out. It's ATS, basically degree of obstruction based on the FEV1. But the caveat, of course, is that the FEV1 over FVC has to be below the lower limits of normal or below the 10 down rule. In this case, it was. And according to this particular scale, the patient has a mild airflow obstruction. So what is asthma? Asthma is defined as airway inflammation. It's also defined in the asthma definition as airflow obstruction or airflow of limitation that is at least partially reversible. They define, the American Thoracic Society defines it as a reversible or transient airflow obstruction where the FEV1 increases by 12, 12 cc's or 12 percent or a minimum of 200 milliliters after bronchodilators. So the FEV1 must move by 12% and also a minimum of 200 milliliters. There has to be a minimum because same time, same person, reproducibility of the FEV1 is only about 100 cc's. So we need to have a minimum after bronchial dilation. Just another way to kind of say that same thing. In children, we usually look for more like, excuse me, in children we look for more likely a 15% reversibility because their values are smaller to begin with. Children, it's 15%. All right. So now the question is, the same patient here, we gave a bronchial dilator. The bronchial dilator protocol is to give four puffs if you're using an MDI. I always tell my tech to check the device, make sure it works or give a NEP treatment of 2.5 milligrams of albuterol. After bronchial dilatation, what we see here is a normalization of the spirometry. We no longer have numbers here in red, so we're moved above the lower limits of normal, and we're seeing that the FEV1 improved from 3.56 liters to 4.19 liters, or the equivalent of actual 18% improvement. American Thoracic Society would call this a mild airflow obstruction that shows significant response to the bronchial dilator albuterol consistent with the diagnosis of asthma. Now be careful, a breathing test isn't the diagnosis of asthma. Asthma is a clinical diagnosis. This will help you move towards a clinical diagnosis of asthma. The two tests here over on this side, you're seeing the pre <coughs> And the blue one here is the post-flow loop. And the same rules apply. They, they have to be good tests, both of them pre and post. And the post-test must have the same rapid rise as the pre-test. So in other words, they should be very traceable in the sense of the beginning of the curve. You have to be able to care, compare apples to apples when you do spirometry. Now, according to the asthma guidelines, this is the 2007 um, NEAPP guidelines for asthma, an FEV1 of 73% would equate to moderate persistent asthma. The FEV1 between 60 and 80% here, and suggests step three therapy. And of course, this is step three, low dose inhaled steroids or in lava, or a long-acting bronchial dilator, or a medium-dose inhaled corticosteroid. Yeah. All right, let's go ahead and do a case study. The only way to get good at doing spirometry is just to read a few cases. This is a six-year-old male with a history of asthma since infancy. States that he has daily cough and wheeze when playing sports. Wakes up three times a week to take his inhaler. Missed five days of school last year because of asthma treated with prednisone once last winter. He reports using his albuterol every day. He used four canisters of albuterol in the past 12 months. Does not perceive his asthma as limiting his activity, but admits he has difficulty keeping up with his friends. Parents believe his asthma is well controlled. So his physical exam, normal vital signs, mild wheezing at end expiration, no prolonged expiratory phase, his heart's normal. 
Currently, he's on just albuterol PRN, and his asthma control score is 12. We see the asthma control score here. I actually added it up wrong. It's 11, but um, you guys are probably using as ACTs or something similar to that to judge the severity of asthma. And we'll get right on to the spirometry test. So first off, we're going to look to see, is this a good test? We see fairly good rapid rise and some traceability on the flow loop. We see the FEV1 ticks really close together. That's all good signs. And then we look over here. The five-year-old needs to blow a minimum of three seconds, which he did. He blew four seconds, and he does plateau. He does have a normal vital capacity. What's not normal in this young child is this little five-year-old should blow 90% of their air out in the first second, and he's only getting about 75% of his air in the first second. This would suggest that his, he has airflow limitation, according to the American Thoracic Society. We use the 10-down rule. Even if this was an, a ratio of 80, we would say it has airflow obstruction. Then we're going to look to, so we're going to say the patient has obstruction. We're going to look at the 84 or the FEV1 to determine the severity of said airflow obstruction. In this case, again, it's a mild airflow obstruction. Then we're going to give a bronchial dilation to the child. And even with little kids, we give four puffs of the albuterol. The American Thoracic Society wants to make sure kids get the medicine. We don't want the physician or provider to be wondering if the patient got med. We want to say, yes, for sure, there was med given, and there was given plenty. And you notice after bronchial dilatation, we see an improvement in the ratio and a nice improvement in the FEV1, a normalization. We see that the FEV1 moved by 17%. Notice that the flow volume loop curve now is a little bit more um, con convex. It's a fairly straight line in little kids when... Um, they're obstructed, but when they're actually normal, it's more convex. In people that have airflow obstruction, it's usually more concave. Okay, nice improvement. And then, of course, we move to the asthma severity. And this is where it gets a little bit more complicated, especially in little kids. The American Thoracic, or excuse me, the NEAPP, the asthma guidelines experts, want us to consider the ratio as well as the FEV1 when determining the severity of said, of said asthma. We know he's got a mild airflow obstruction that shows significant response to bronchial dilator consistent with the diagnosis of asthma, but then we're going to use his symptoms to determine the severity of said asthma. He had daily symptoms. He had lots of symptoms at night. He was taking his albuterol daily. And his ratio was between, actually it was right at 75, so somewhere between moderate and severe asthma. Now how the asthma guidelines work is you always, always use the most severe, whether it's symptoms or objective measures like spirometry. You're using the most severe to determine where you're going to start. When we're talking about somebody who's just on albuterol, we're talking about asthma severity. Once you put a patient on a controller medicine, then we switch and we start talking about asthma control. But since Randy was only on a albuterol, we're talking about asthma severity. And his asthma severity is somewhere between moderate and severe, and he should be on step three or step four treatment. A little bit slightly different, um, the parameters for ages 5 to 11, they're basically the same as for 12 and above. But again, this is the stepwise approach. You should probably be somewhere on step 4 or 5 treatment. And of course, we're going to give them an asthma action plan. So we did. We put them on some good medications, sent them home with an inhaled corticosteroid. Uh, middle, middle dose of inhaled cortical steroid, and he is now still using his albuterol PRN. So he's coming back two weeks later for his follow-up. Currently on inhaled cortical steroid with albuterol PRN. He admits that he's not taking his steroid every day. He reports using albuterol three times a week, so much improved there. Although his activity is improved, he still reports occasional wheezing. And again, his parents believe that his asthma is well controlled. Vital signs, normal, chest no wheeze or prolonged ex expiratory phase, his heart's normal. 
Now, his spirometry suggests an FEV1 of 90% and a ratio of 76. And his asthma control score has improved to 19. So this is his spirometry after two weeks of being on an inhaled corticosteroid. You notice that the ratio is still kind of down. We have moved his vital capacity up more, and his FEV1 is now at 90% as opposed to 84%. After bronchial dilation, we see some response to bronchial dilator, but we may be reaching Randy's personal best now that we have him on good treatment. We're going to encourage Randy to be more religious about taking his inhaled corticosteroid and do a little teaching about the importance of decreasing the inflammation with his parents. We see that his asthma control score has improved. His symptoms are better. His spirometry is better. And now that he is on a controller med, depending on how well you question him and determining if you're saying that he's taking it religious enough to say that he's taking it. Now, if a patient that you prescribed an inhaled corticosteroid comes to you and says, well, I'm not taking it every day, when we go back to talking about severity. But if they are taking their inhaled corticosteroids religiously, then we go to asthma control. His FEV1 now is in the 80%, which would suggest that he's having well-controlled asthma. He still has a lot of symptoms. And, of course, the question is, should we step up or reevaluate in two to six weeks? If the asthma is well-controlled in all categories for three months, then we talk about possibility of well-controlled asthma after three months is to step down the patient. Again... Guidelines suggest we always want to check for adherence before we adjust our medications, look for environmental triggers that can be assisted with or changed, um, and then assess control from that. Any questions for me out there? Did this help at all? Um, I don't think that they can. Can, can you hear us, Ed? I can hear you. Okay, good. What was the question again? I can't hear the question. You'll have to repeat it, please. Right, just, I think the microphone is on there. Hi, our question is, at the two-week follow-up after the spirometry, did Randy get stepped up? Was that the conclusion? Well, he was put on an inhaled corticosteroid for two weeks, and then he mm -hmm. came back to the clinic. He wasn't stepped up because he admitted to us that he really wasn't taking his inhaled corticosteroids every day. So we really wanted to encourage him to take it every day, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to putting him on a higher dose of the inhaled corticosteroid. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Okay. A lot of times that's what happens is that there's a real um, steroid phobia, as you pediatricians know, in our asthma community, and many times uh, the parents or the patients um, are reluctant to take their inhaled corticosteroid. That's why there's a, a you know huge effort that needs to be done to tell them how the um, steroids affect the inflammation part of asthma. Do we have other any other questions for me? Do you have secrets for coaching young children to participate with their spirometry? You know, there are a couple of incentives in spirometers. Most spirometers have different incentives. And I never jump to the birthday cake first. What you want to do is you want to find an incentive that gets bigger, 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 like you pick a balloon, right? And the balloon gets bigger, bigger, bigger as the child blows longer. What happens in little kids, they take a big breath and they blast hard and then they stop. And so your ratios are never very accurate in little kids because they don't blow all their vital capacity out. But what you do is you get an incentive. In other words, the child's watching a balloon or a something getting bigger, bigger, bigger. And I use the words, instead of blow, 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 I use the word bigger, bigger, bigger. And then as they get the balloon bigger and bigger, it doesn't take them very long, even a little kid, like five or six, to say, oh, I get it. The longer I go, the bigger the balloon gets. And so I use those types of incentives with my little kids. 
I also spend a lot of time coaching the little the little child about getting in as much as they possibly can. That's one of the biggest problems both in adult and pediatric spirometry is the child or the person doesn't fill their lungs full before they blast out. That's something that we got to really concentrate more, and we need to teach our CMAs and our medical assistants and our nurses to make sure the patient is packed full of air before they blast. Then it seems to be if you take a big, huge, giant breath, pack in as much as you can, the blasting out becomes almost natural. You want to get that air out because it's, there's so much elastic recoil in the chest, the air wants to come out. So I would couple that with um, um, having some sort of a visual incentive for the child that gets bigger as the child blows longer. That's that's what, how we have the most success here at, in our pediatric lab. Great Thank question, so though. Great question. We'll, we'll focus on the word bigger, 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 rather than blow, 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 or more, more, more. You know, if you ask a little, or a lot of times when you tell a little kid five or six to blow, you know what they do? They suck. <laughs> Matter of fact, you it gets frustrating for some people that yell blow, 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 because when you tell a child to blow, what do they do? They take a big breath. They've been trained to blow out the candle. And so to a little kid, blow means suck. And so what happens is that as soon as you yell blow, blow, the second time you yell blow, they breathe back in exactly what they think they're supposed to be doing. So I don't use the word blow. I have them pack in as much as they can. I have them blast, and then I say, keep going, keep going, bigger, 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 okay. if they're looking at the visual incentive. Does that make sense? Yes. Other questions for me? Can you talk just a little bit about um, air trapping and how that can, be, how that's going to show up on spirometry? Well, in a patient that has air trapping, what we notice is the vital capacity is low. I don't really have a good case of air trapping. It doesn't happen very often in little children unless they're really in an acute situation. But what happens in patients that air trap is the vital capacity starts getting below the normal values, right? Because the air is trapped up inside their chest. You can imagine that the airways are swollen. There's a smooth muscle contracting down around the airways. What that does is it increases the closing volume. In other words, where the airways close becomes higher and higher on the lung capacity. So in other words, if you were to take a big, huge breath in and then blow hard, you can't get all the air out. That air is trapped. The air trapped is actually an increase in residual volume. We all have residual volume in our chest. As a matter of fact, our residual volume is about a third of our total lung capacity. But what happens when people start air trapping due to severe obstruction, the residual volume increases at expense to the vital capacity. And what happens after you give a bronchial dilator, normally what will happen is you'll see a nice increase in the vital capacity. Now you don't really see it here in Randy because when he started out his vital capacity was 101%. But after treatment, it got up to 109%, right? So he did have a teeny bit of air trapping even though his vital capacity teeny air trapping for himself, even though his vital capacity was normal. Now, that can get very severely acute in patients that are having a severe asthma exacerbation. Take a big breath, everybody, big as you can, big, big, huge breath, and breathe right up at the top of the breathing. Breathe right at the top. That's what it feels like to have an asthma attack. Then they take a big breath and they blow out. The airways collapse, and they can't get that air out. That's what air trapping is all about. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you have any other any any other questions, group? I think I think that that's actually about. If then for our questions, they were very attentive listeners. I know that you can't see us, but we sure appreciate this. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for letting me be part of your program. And I had a good time, even though I'm staring at a computer and talking to the wall. But uh, <laughs> good luck to you guys in your practice.
Thank you very much. All right, take care, guys. Bye-bye.